Welcome to the Reversion to the Mean podcast, hosted by Justin Castelli of RLS Wealth Management and Kevin of FerventFinance.com. On Reversion to the Mean, Justin and Kevin will discuss the week's top financial Twitter shares and distill them down to what's necessary and what's noise. This podcast is for entertainment purposes only. Nothing discussed on this podcast should be considered professional advice. The opinions expressed by the hosts are theirs and theirs only. Welcome to episode 39 of Reversion to the Mean. This week, we're going to kick it off with an article from the Wall Street Journal that was talking about texting and smartphones at the gym. So when I was living in New York and then for the past couple of years, I've, I've been going to a commercial gym, but I actually built a home gym in my basement. So I kind of exclusively work out there now. So I don't really have to worry about this. But when you're at a commercial gym, you know, people are either working out or they're on their phones doing whatever they're doing on their phones, texting, taking pics, blah, blah, blah. Well, I guess, you know, a lot of gyms like when their customers have their phones at the gym because they'll be tagging the gym and showing showing their friends that they're working out um, and it probably drives, you know, customers to their gym. So they, they kind of like it, I'm sure. But, you know, it can get aggravating if you're trying to work out and someone's just sitting at a machine or in your way and they're texting or on the phone, even like talking on the phone too, taking, taking business calls from, from the squat rack um, can get a little aggravating, but I, I kind of found, I found this, this was a little funny. It wasn't too serious of an article from the wall street journal. I've never seen anybody take a call like while working out, unless they had like AirPods in. So they're still moving, but to like sit there on the machine and work, I've never seen. Um, I've seen people texting and, and things of that sort. And obviously you see the pictures. I've never, so I just went back to a Globo gym. I never thought I would do this, but um, I decided to no longer do my CrossFit stuff at the gym. I do it at home now, but I had, there's a gym right by my office so I can get over and back real quick. And you do see some of the, the posing pictures and all of that fun stuff. Um, so I, I get why the gyms like it. And I think it's kind of like no publicity is bad publicity. So it's good for them to see that. Um, and to do with Instagram and all the stuff that goes on, there's no way you're going to stop people from doing it. I do think that the proper etiquette of no FaceTime video type stuff in the locker room is prudent. Like yeah. I don't think you should be messing around with that. Um, but if somebody wants to take a picture of themselves in the mirror in the, in the locker room, and as long as nobody else is in the background, I don't have any issue with that. Do you have issue with people like Lawrence taking videos of their front squats all the time? No, cause I do it too. <laughs> um, and, and I think there are, there is something to be said that for some people that are videoing it, like they're looking at form or they maybe they have a remote coaching relationship where they send the video to, yeah. um, to their coach, but usually you can tell those people because they're pretty serious about the way they go about lifting. It's not getting the right angle and making sure the light's hitting them properly and make sure this muscle's popping out. Like it's just functional, like up and down. Let me make sure I'm doing things right. And it's fun to share it with your friends. So I think it could be done in a tasteful way. Uh, but I definitely don't think you should be having loud conversations and, and annoying people or rest. Like they talked about the guy resting on the, was it the leg press watching lost? Like that's yeah. ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. I think but it, what my, what I think the biggest offense is they talked about, was it planet fitness that has the alarm that if you drop the weight or grunt, like yeah, the, what the kind of gym alarm. can you, what can you not, what kind of gym can you not grunt? Like, you don't have to be the ridiculous one grunting, but it's nearly impossible for me to go up and down in a squat and not have some type of noise. Like it's impossible. That is weak. That was, I, that's the, to me, that's the most offensive thing of this whole thing is planet fitness calling you out for having a good hard workout. I think yeah. it's the same place they give you pizza on the way out. So <laughs> yeah, planet fitness isn't a real gym. So I don't think you have to worry about that. Cause I don't, I don't see you going there, but uh, yeah, I think as long as you're doing it outside of the locker room, you know, you're not taking video in the locker room, you're conscious of the people around you. So you're not kind of in their way when they're trying to actually work out and you're, you know, watching a video or uh, you know, Instagramming or something. So just, you know, kind of be cognizant of the people around you. And you know, I think it's fine. Just don't be a dick. Yep. So you had shared this next uh, Wall Street Journal piece, Facebook building cryptocurrency based payment system. I just think it's interesting. Um, you know, ever since, fa or since Facebook, since Bitcoin's crashed and cryptocurrencies no longer are, are exciting to talk about, I feel like 
the conversation about it is not near as much as it used to be. Maybe you and I see a little bit more than most, just because FinTwit still talks about it a little bit. But the you know the average conversations, the Thanksgiving dinners where everybody's talking about it aren't happening anymore. And it's just interesting to see you know the potential uses for cryptocurrencies and how companies are going to use it. I think I saw a while back, like maybe a week or two ago, Nike was even talking about having a digital coin to to buy and sell. So it just talks about how Facebook's going to be trying to create its own crypto basically to allow users and businesses to conduct business through their their platform and it'd be interesting to see if it's adopted because then you think about the bigger picture of like the credit cards like visa and mastercard that i think for so long have been insulated because everybody use that uses at the shop like if i shop online it's always on a credit card yeah. just because of the protections well now they may be bypassed if you're going to be doing a lot of shopping through facebook which I don't know how much of that goes down, but if, I'm assuming that they get this crypto thing. They're going to be bringing stores in to be able to shop. Uh, so I just think it's interesting. I I think that the technology will only improve. I think more people will adopt it. It'll be here. It may not replace like the dollar fully, but I think you may see more ways to use it and more companies issuing their own coins to conduct business in a real way, not like the shady ICOs that were about about a year and a half ago. Yeah, I have no idea if the actual users of Facebook and Instagram will adopt the, you know, Facebook cryptocurrency uh, payment system. But what was crazy is one of the stats was one third of the world's population logs onto Facebook monthly. And that's just crazy to me to think about, you know, one third of the world is logging into Facebook. So when you, you know, add on WhatsApp and you add on Instagram, you know, Facebook just has a a stranglehold on the social media of basically the world. And I'm sure that they can, you know, start to monetize that a little more. Um, I know Instagram does a lot of the, I, I don't use Facebook, but I do use Instagram and I know they have a lot of the kind of the ads where you can click and, you know, shop direct from the ads um, and things like that. So I'm sure they're thinking of uh, a way to monetize that a little better, uh, you know, maybe with a, their own kind of crypto based payment system. But yeah, I have no idea if it'll, it'll catch on because like you said, using a credit card online right now is it's the safest thing in my mind. So I don't think I'll see people varying too far from that, at least uh, in the near future. Did you get to catch the point that you, so, you know, like cryptocurrencies can be divided up into like increments of coins yeah. that they were talking about rewarding people for viewing ads with, yeah, with that was like interesting. fractions yeah. of the coins. That's how you get people to accept it because they'll watch it. They'll get, they'll get a minor amount of it, but they'll build it up and then they'll have enough to maybe buy something or close. So then they'll have to add their own dollars in to buy the coin. And then they, that that's how they're going to adopt people is give a little bit of it away for free. Um, and then, you know, they're charging the advertisers anyway. So, um, I think that that's pretty clever, but I'm with you. I think that this really plays more into Instagram than it does on Facebook. Like I know this from one store in the whole world's experiences, but my wife gets a lot of business from Instagram and not as much from Facebook for her little store. And she's got it where you can you know, if you follow her, you look at the picture, you can click on the picture, it pulls up the shirt, you click on that, it takes you right to the store and you can buy it. So before long, it'll just bypass. You'll click on the image, you'll click buy, the currency will go through and that'll be it. So it'll, it'll be pretty cool. Um, I'd be curious to see how they're able to stable it. They talk about a stable coin backed by like normal fiat, but it'd be interesting to see how they stabilize that so it's not wild, wild all over the place. So last week, Beyond Meat had an IPO and it soared, I guess, 163% uh, above its offering price. And I don't know if, have you had a Beyond Burger yet? I've never had a Beyond Meat burger or sausage, but it caught my attention. Yeah. I'd like so to try I, it just to see. Yeah. So there's an Impossible Burger and a Beyond Burger that I, I tried both of them. I think I, I liked the Beyond a little bit more. And I had listened to uh, a podcast that's not going to come to me right now. Uh, what? who did the uh, podcast, but it talked about these, you know, artificial kind of burgers that are made to look like a real burger and have like the juice in the middle and, you know, taste as close as you can get to a, you know, beef burger without actually containing any meat. And the technology behind it is just ridiculous. Like these are, you know, like scientists and engineers and PhDs working on these formulas to get it as close as possible without it actually being the real thing. So I, th I find the science behind it pretty cool. And it gives people 
who are kind of on the fence where, you know, they're like, oh, you know, I'd eat less meat, but you know, the, the product just doesn't taste good. Like, you know, this, they'll probably be able to convert a, a bunch of people who are, you want to eat a little less meat for whatever, you know, re- reason of theirs that they, they want to do that. And they'll, you know, they'll come over to this side where uh, they'll be, you know, eating a more engineered version of a burger that I, I'm assuming that, you know, has been tested and tested. And I, I don't think these things are too harmful for you. Um, I, I think they're kind of branded as more, you know, a, a healthy uh, alternative. So uh, I just found it interesting. And I, they're not half bad. I mean, they're not a real burger, but, you know, uh, I, I think if you dress them up a decent amount and put the right stuff on them uh, and keep an open mind, they're not too bad. So I have a lot of thoughts on this. Uh, if we go down memory lane, this is way before I knew you. I mean, nutrition is something that I'm real interested in and trying different things. So when the boys were younger, Ange and I were like, we tried vegan for like two days. It was impossible. It was dairies <laughs> and everything. And I'm a pretty picky eater. I've gotten a lot better as I've gotten older. But then we did vegetarian for a while and we tried some of the like meatless burger replacements. And I mean, they're not very good, but I think... I think whether or not this stuff is actually healthy for you depends on the science that you want to believe. So I've read all types of books. There's one that the one that made me try being a vegetarian was called the China study. And the long of this, the short of this long book is basically animal products leads to cancer and other illnesses. If you look at other cultures that don't eat a lot of uh, meat, they're a lot healthier. So you should have like the, you know, this is, I think a lot of pea uh, protein is how they make these burgers and stuff. So a lot of soybeans and other, other types but then if you go down another alley, you see that this stuff's not – that stuff's not good for you either because it's been genetic, genetically modified and all this stuff. So I, like, I never know what is the best thing to do. Um, so that fascinates me as far as is this really healthier than the beef that we're eating? Who knows? And then the whole like environmental aspect of it as well. Like I'm not a – I wouldn't say I'm an environmentalist, but I also am aware and want to try to do what I can to make sure we don't ruin the earth. Um, but you have the whole like green movement and the cows and their gases that they're emitting are going to ruin our world. And um, I don't know if I believe in that either, but I think that like there's a lot of potential for this to do better because if you can make something taste good, like you said, you can pull people over. And if you dress it up enough and make it so if it, if it was actually healthy for you, it's no longer healthy for you by putting ketchup and bacon, well, not bacon, fake bacon on it, <laughs> uh, then the people would eat it. But I was watching um, CNBC, the halftime report when it, when it uh, IPO'd and they had John Sally on. I don't know if you remember him. He played, uh, oh, played yeah. Pistons. Played in yeah, NBA. He's player. a big, he's a big investor in this. And it sounds like he's done real well investing, but he's been an investor for a long time. He's been vegan for, for a while, I guess. Um, and he was talking about all of this and the benefits and he highlighted that there's a steakhouse in either Florida or California. That's a, like an expensive steakhouse and they're 50% vegan and they, like they serve this stuff there as well, which hmm. I thought was interesting. Yeah. So I definitely think that with the millennials and their values and things that they appreciate, whether it's right or wrong and what they think is important allows companies like this to have a, have a future. But that IPO day was ridiculous. No endorsement of a purchase or sell of this at all. This is not a recommendation. Just talking about a food food company. All right, you sent over a real long one that I read the beginning, skimmed the middle, read the end again um, from Epsilon Theory called Starry Eyes and Starry Skies. Why don't you give us the rundown? Yeah, so this definitely was a longer read for sure. And um, this I is- knew I wasn't going to read it all when I saw... Uh, for paid subscription, you can download the PDF. <laughs> I'm like, oh, it's a PDF, Kevin. So, uh, but, you know, I, I kind of like the conversations that are happening around uh, secondary education right now. And I've, I've been following Lambda School a lot, which is the coding school where, you know, you don't pay a tuition. You enter into kind of like a revenue sharing agreement or well, income sharing agreement once you graduate and get a full time job. And, I, I, you know, Everyone's putting up the charts that are showing education costs are skyrocketing way faster than inflation and and fast and faster than all these other costs. And you know, it's got to. I think it has to stop eventually. I don't know when that will be. I don't know what will be the catalyst. Maybe it'll be more um, schools like Lambda School that do more of the vocational training in a shorter period of time. So you have less of what I like to call like the the fluff classes that aren't really going to contribute at least directly to your. Ch- Uh, chosen like vocation or career. And, you know, I I think that could be, you know, one 
way this goes, but this, this article itself kind of just walks through like, what is um, college in America? Why do we, you know, cherish it so much? Why do we hold it in such high regard? Um, why do, why does everyone feel like they're obligated to go now? And he, um, the author brings up some good points where, um, you know, a vocational type shorter school that's like no longer than a year or two is probably better for a majority of people. I'm an accountant. I didn't need to go to college for four years to learn to be an accountant. It could have been much more uh, concentrated in the things I needed to pass the CPA exam. And, you know, I could, there could also be some electives that are more, you know, well-rounded, but it doesn't need to be two years worth. Right. And I could have got done much faster. It could have been much cheaper. I would have entered the workforce sooner um, and been just as prepared or maybe even more prepared because the classes would have been more geared towards exactly what I needed to succeed in, in a CPA type career. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of like this, this, how we, how America thinks about college and, and in a lot of jobs, it's kind of like a basic requirement to even get looked at. If you don't have a bachelor's degree, you know, your resume might get thrown in the trash and that's unfortunate, but that's the truth. And it's going to take just a change in how people think about college and specifically like the bachelor's degree of, of being kind of that basic thing you need before you can get a job. And it's going to take a lot of time. Now, personally, for me, I think the way you fix the cost of college, which is the main issue, you know, four, four years of college wouldn't be a problem if it was, you know, cheap for people and they're not going to graduate with a ton of debt. But if you're going to graduate college in four years with a ton of debt, you know, I think one way to fix that is to go after the colleges. Um, you know, they have advantageous tax treatment. They have these huge endowments that never get taxed. Uh, they can do, they're basically operating as hedge funds, at least with the, the big university. Um, you know, they're all uh, nonprofit uh, universities. So basically, you know, in my mind, I would put a cap on how much tuition can increase per year or how much a, you know, in-state school can charge for tuition. Maybe let the, you know, the privates can do whatever they want, but at least that'll maybe start setting the standard for how much a, a, a degree should cost and how much it should increase year to year. And then I think people will have to fall in line or else they'll face consequences like taxing the endowment um, if they don't use a certain percentage towards tuition or for aid for students and things like that. Um, you know, there's a, a million different things that you can do um, to, to kind of fix the problem. I don't know if that's the right one, but in my mind that could possibly work. But yeah, it's a, it's a long read, but I think he brings up a lot of good points just about how we think about college, um, whether that's, you know, right or wrong and just different ways to kind of think about it going forward, just so people don't get stuck in that trap of, Oh, I have to go to college, even though it might not be the best decision for you. It's totally because that's what we're supposed to do from day one, going to school, we're told you have to go to college and that's not to minimize the value of an education, but to the point here, I th they even highlight finance. Like we could, I could be doing my job with a much shorter degree, more focus. I think the tough thing with that though, is going into college at 18. How do you know what you want to do yeah. to just take the very focused courses? Um, I guess one benefit would be if you go down that path to do the focus course to become a CPA in one year and you don't like it, that's one year you waste and you can go try another path. And now you have multiple skills. Um, I mean, I, in some ways I'm kind of in favor of having kind of those gap years. So having a couple of years out of high school to go actually work and do certain careers and see what's out there and then go back to school. And I know that the momentum, once you break going to school, it's hard to get people to go back. But if that was the the procedure that we all went through. So you graduate college, the next, like the first two years, quote unquote of college would be a work program where you're in things you're interested in and maybe you rotate around and actually have a career almost. And then the next thing is you go to school if that's what makes sense. I think there's different ways. I think, I think it starts with th these types of conversations and I think it starts with our generation and I'm older than you. So my, my generation, but I'm going to be more open to creative ways for the boys to go to school because one, I don't have a goal to fully fund their college. I want to live along the way and I want to retire. So I'm not going to put it all in college so they can go to college. And my wife, I mean, I was spoiled. My parents paid for most of my college. I took over some loans at the end. My wife had to work. And we had this conversation the other night. She had no idea that kids could leave with a hundred grand in student loans. She's like, how? And she, she worked to put herself through college. She saved. She only took out loans that like the, like it's a small amount of loans she could take out. And she made it work by working through and working two jobs in the summer. And that's just like, she had four other siblings. So she knew her parents weren't going to be able to help. So she had to go that way. And I think that 
seeing our friends, seeing what it does to people who have that student loan debt, we're going to be more open to, okay, four-year college isn't right for you. Two-year school is perfect. You just need an associate's or a focus program and go off and do it or do the Lambda school. Or I even read about investors um, investing in the future earnings of students. So basically it's very similar to the Lambda deal where someone will pay your tuition and then when you graduate, depending on your type of degree, you will pay back a percentage of your income for a set period of time. And I know that that's technically not different than a loan. It's, I mean, it's kind of a loan, but there is no interest going on it. There's an end date on it. And I think that's a much better way than giving a kid an unlim- basically an unlimited amount of student loans that they don't know what they're doing. I just think that those opportunities would be good. And if the boys, I would love for them to be entrepreneurs and come up with businesses and figure things out on their own. I would, I mean, I would be fine if they didn't go to school, if they had a good game plan that that didn't really require it. Um, I think one way, if you cap the amount of loans somebody could get, that would limit because if you know, you can only go out and get, you know, $20,000 in student loans over your four years, you can't afford to go to a $40,000 a year school because there's no way for you to fund that. Then I think the supply and demand might bring some of those prices down. Um, I don't know. It's 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 definitely going to change. I, I will give a shout out. I didn't go to Purdue. I could care less about Purdue, honestly. But <laughs> Purdue has not raised tuition for for a very long period of time, and they're doing some creative things. Um, our former governor Mitch Daniels, who I went to high school with his daughters, um, he's the president there now, and he's done a lot of creative things to keep their tuition in line. So um, I think it's going to change. It has to. I just with you, I, I don't know what the tipping point is going to be, but it's coming. It probably be like our grandkids. Um, that will finally see a little bit of relief. Yeah, and uh, so we're going to switch topics uh, back to sports here uh, from the New York Times. Uh, there was They had an article about how the NBA is moving to the three-point shot. And, I mean, if you follow the NBA, it's kind of been happening for a while now, specifically, uh, you know, with the Golden State Warriors and the Rockets for the past five-plus years, been kind of moving from the two-point shot to the three-point shot as part of their strategy. And I find this interesting because, you know, the data analytics has moved to the NBA faster than it's moved to other sports. There was money ball for baseball, but it seems like the NBA is really uh, utilizing data analytics to understand the game at that more granular level of what what actually works and what's going to give you an advantage uh, against other teams. And um, a couple of these guys have kind of made their rounds uh, on the finance uh, podcast. And I know one of the guys I think was on like masters in business, but the GM for the Rockets is Daryl Morey. And I know he's a big data analytics guy. And they talk about him in this article here because James Harden and the Rockets just shoot a ton of threes. But I was, it was just random because I was talking about this with a friend the other day. And it's kind of funny, I think, that it took a while for people to figure this out where these NBA players are just so good at shooting threes. You know, say you shoot 40% from three point range and you shoot. Uh, 50% from two point range, like the three point shot is worth 50% more and you're, Mm -hmm. you're making it almost as much as you're making the two point shot. So just like intuitively it makes sense, but I guess it just took like a long time for, for people to move to that. And, you know, and I think in football, uh, if you look at the analytics, you know, teams shouldn't punt like 90% of the time, but they still punt because that's the game and that's what people are accustomed to. And coaches don't want to get fired for doing something new, but it seems like, you know, the three point shot has really kind of taken over the NBA and I'm kind of interested to see where that'll go from here. I was a three point shooter, so I love that. I hate it because that's all Roman wants to do and he's not strong enough to shoot threes. So it messes <laughs> his form up. That really frustrates me. Uh, but yeah, I, I it is a th- the, I think the thing that changed it, and they mentioned Dirk Nowitzki, I think once you started having bigger guys being able to shoot the three more, mm-hmm. it spreads the court out even more and it makes it easier to drive and pass. And um, and then if you have the big guy shooting it, that's another person who's going to be throwing it up. So in some ways it's good. Um, and honestly, just from experience, and maybe it's just because of my um, shooting skills, those mid-range shots have always been harder mm-hmm. um, because usually you're not getting them in a spot-up situation. You're driving and then stopping your momentum and trying to go up, and it's a tough shot. So they said either you're going for a layup or a dunk or you're shooting a three in that mid- mid-range mid area. You don't really get that easy setup. So it's a harder – it's a more difficult shot um, to make. And I'm just going to pat myself on the back in college my senior year – for most of the season, I was leading all of NCAA at three-point percentage. 
but then I didn't shoot enough to qualify at the oh. end. But so, so listen to this three game run I had. I was seven for seven, four of five, and three of four. Three games in a row. Why didn't you shoot more? I hated missing, <laughs> and I always like I always played by played by the rules. I never took a shot that wasn't like a good shot, which is why I shot a high percentage. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, so I, I just wanted to brag a little bit. <laughs> no worries. Um, yeah, so we'll we'll stand this uh, sports train here. And the Wall Street Journal had an article about the drafts, NFL drafts, most frugal player. So this article actually came out before the NFL draft. And I looked up where uh, this Clemson player, Christian Wilkins, was drafted. He was drafted 13th overall in the NFL draft after this article came out. But it just goes to talk about how um, conscious he is with his personal finances and how it's, you know, it's unfortunately that's not the the given when it comes to uh, college athletes. And it walked through some of um, the things he's done in college and he's throughout college, he's saved $15,000 and it noted that the players make like 1500 bucks a month um, while they're in school, which has to cover if you live off campus. So it covers your you have to cover your rent with that. You have to cover food with that. Um, so, you know, it, it 1500 bucks doesn't go that long of a way if you have, you know, a, a nice apartment and you're going out to eat and stuff. But of that money, he saved like $15,000 by saving, uh, by living in a $300 a month apartment, riding his bike around campus, not driving a car around campus and budgeting. So he would give himself a certain amount that he could spend eating out, Um, And the way he would budget is he'd break his bank account into four separate accounts. And one would be for like eating out and going out. And the other one would uh, be for just like your normal everyday expenses. And that's how he would do it. Um, So you just have to find whatever works for you. And then additionally, he would substitute teach for $80 a day while he was in college to make a little more spending money. Well, for him, he, it seems like he saved it. But there's one quote on the, at the end, I kind of got a, uh, a kick out of, uh, he said, I'll be that guy still forever sneaking food into the movie theater. But if I didn't have time to run to the store beforehand, I'll still buy that large popcorn, which shows that, you know, you can be frugal, but you don't have to go too extreme. And, uh, if you, if you forget to put the candy in your coat pocket, you can, don't be afraid to buy the popcorn. So the only thing I didn't like about this, and this is because of my wife the fact that he made his own lemonade by getting water and asking for lemons and putting sugar in it, like it's two bucks for a lemonade and you realize that the waitress that is waiting on you is tipped off of your total balance. And and she, she just told me, I never forget this. When we started dating in college, she worked at Fridays and she said people would come in and they would, or he didn't think of this. They would order, this is 15, 16 years ago, waters with lemons and put lemonade in there so they didn't have to buy a drink. And that's like, Come on, either make that up in the tip or don't be such a cheap ass when it comes to that. Like, I, I love the frugality. Do that at home if you want to do it. But you're going out and somebody's working and like what you spend helps attribute to what they're making and they get paid very little. Like, I think that kind of sucks. But otherwise, I love the behavior behind it. Um, the cynic in me, which I don't think this is the case because he, you know, did the student or the substitute teaching would be, well, how much were the boosters kicking him under the table that we don't know about? I mean, if you're the 13th pick, that means you're a pretty big player. Um, were people, but again, I'm, there's no reason to think that's the case. That's the cynic, which I'm not very cynical, but the fact that he was doing these other things leads me to believe that he did all of that on his own by being frugal. So I, I think it's good. Um, we'll see if he ends up being on that hard knock show trying to teach his friends like investing news like having like earlier this year. I have to call you out. You're, you've been kind of a, a pessimist with this post here, Justin, with the, the lemonade. I think it was, I think and, it was the and lemonade. Him getting money from the boosters. You, it just went downhill real fast. Like I guess I think, I think it was the lemonade that jaded me. Um, and I, like I said, I honestly don't think that that booster thing was it, but, <laughs> uh, but, uh, but I would, the positive out of this, the spin to it is, we won't go down this avenue. They should definitely be play, paying these athletes more than fifteen hundred dollars a month. And don't get at me with the they get a free college tuition thing because they're making buku bucks off these kids. I just don't know how you do it because I would think you'd have to do like revenue share of the jerseys that are sold. So think about think about that. Like all of these colleges sell jerseys with the numbers attributed to the kids, and yeah. maybe the numbers not maybe the names not on the back. But there's – was he 42? There's a number 42 on Clemson's football team at the same time they're selling that jersey. Yeah. Um, like like that that frustrates me. So if if boosters were kicking the money, I am mad at them. Like, like get yours. So 
<laughs> but again, don't don't Christian. I don't think you really did that. If you by had by chance listen to this, I don't <laughs> think that really happened. I was just being cynical and being a jerk because you shorted a waitress a tip on a two dollar lemonade. Hey, he could have still <laughs> tipped her. You don't know. Um, I doubt it. <laughs> <laughs> so the. Our last piece is from the New York Times, and I thought this one was uh, was good because it, it talks about the case for doing nothing. Now, you know the you're big into Gary V, and you're a busy guy. You're an entrepreneur. You have three kids, so um, and people have commented on Twitter about how like you have more than 24 hours in a day and things like that. So I wanted your take on what what you thought of this, you know, the case for doing nothing and actually, you know, taking some time to get away from the work and get away from the being online and being on your computer or your phone and kind of just taking you time to relax, whether that, however that's, you know, you want to define it. But what did you think, Justin? I, th- I think it's true. Um, I, f- I find time for myself, whether it be like, it talks about like, if you're starting to get tired, go walk around. Like I will take a 20 minute nap in the middle of the day. Like if I, I feel myself getting drowsy, I'll lock the door to my office, turn the lights off, set a timer and I'll take a 20 minute nap. Uh, like, Power naps are awesome. I love them. And the crazy thing is it's almost it's almost more like a meditation. It's weird. Like I'll even do it at home. I'll come home and I'll say, hey, I need a 10-minute power nap. And I'll sit on the couch and I'll, I'll be aware of what's going on, but I'm out. And then I feel rejuvenated. So I, I do that. And then like tonight, um, I got home from the office. I went in the garage and worked out, which is a little bit of kind of me time. And then I cut my workout short because Roman was outside playing basketball and I played him one-on-one. So like my my me time usually is something active. And it's something with the family. So it's not to the point of like, I'm not sitting around doing nothing, but I'm not thinking about work. I'm not thinking about writing something or recording something or editing something. Um, But I'd also say that I do think I'm in a a different position where the ability to do nothing is not as easy for other people. And that's not a woe is me. But when you do have your own business, and right now it's me and one other person. Like there's a lot of moving pieces that have to be taken care of. And I chose that and I love it. So I wouldn't change it. But I don't think that like I don't have a nine to five where I come home. And I realize that everybody takes a little bit of work home with them. But it's it's a, I think it's a little bit different when it's you're working for a business and working for somebody else versus it is your business. It's always living. Um, and then you add on all the content stuff I like to create that that does it. So the final comment is the content, like doing this podcast, doing the videos, I, I love it. Like it's a hobby for me. So for some people, golf is their hobby or weightlifting is their hobby, whatever it might be. Like this is another one of my hobbies. So I, I enjoy doing this. It's fun for me. This almost is a little bit of, of nothing. Like I'm having a conversation with a friend every week. Like that's not draining on my brain. Now the editing takes a little bit of time, but that's not a big deal. So I do think that people need to carve out time and I could probably do a better job of doing that. Um, you know, one of the things I did, I've since put it back on, but I took Twitter off my phone for a while, but that time I had it off kind of broke me from my habit of being connected to my phone more. So I am phones in the kitchen. I've got Twitter. Like I have to scroll like three pages over to get to the app. And honestly, the only reason I put it back on was it's easier to put pictures up on Twitter, um, that way. So I think it's important. I think it's hard to do. I think the um, technology and like social media stuff is what makes it the hardest for everybody. Um, but I also think a lot of people who are saying they're working all the time or always busy, it's for show. Yeah. Um, well, that's so. Yeah, that was the point I was going to make is um, this article does a good job of kind of calling that out. And there's that kind of social culture norm where you know people ask how you're doing oh i'm you know i'm busy and like yeah i'm busy too and and it's just you're supposed to be busy right but a lot of the times that's just bs you know either you know you're busy for the wrong reasons or you're not busy and you're just saying you are so i like that um this article had said uh if you're doing nothing own it so when someone asks you what you're doing during a nothing break simply respond nothing or you know you're on break you're on holiday whatever um so i i, I thought that was cool I think, I think another key to it, um, is being efficient with your time. So I've learned like tonight we recorded this a little bit later than we had planned because Leo had practice. So I took Leo to practice and I worked while I was sitting. Like, I guess I could have sat there and read a book and done nothing, but it was an hour, beautiful day, had my laptop out. I got everything ready for this podcast as far as the WordPress and, and that's taken care of. So then when we get done, I'll do the edit and I'll have time later on to do nothing. So I think it's about 
um, efficiency as well. Um, the one thing I do need to do better is kind of like vacation, like vacation. We haven't done much late, like in the last few years, just with starting businesses. And then when I am on vacation, I'm still kind of working. So that's one thing I look forward to as I can grow my firm to have somebody that will actually allow me to like disconnect for a little while and, and not be thinking about it, but, um, definitely hard to do. Do you have any recommendations this week? I do. I have two recommendations. Do you watch, uh, this was just a specific episode. Do you watch billions on Showtime? I, I do, but I'm not caught up. I'm like a season behind. So I, I like billions. It's a show about a hedge fund and there's all this drama and storylines behind it. But last night's episode, this won't be a spoiler or anything, had a lot of people guests guests in it that I like. So um, Jocko Will Link was in it. Tim Ferriss was in it. And then downtown Josh Brown finally made a cameo, which I don't know if you knew, but Josh um, was is a, one of a like a consultant to the to the show to help out with making it sound like they're actually talking about finance. Yep. Um, but he made a cameo where he was probably on there a few times. So it's kind of cool to see friends on there and then see people that um, I like to follow and read. Like I'm a big Jocko fan, so it's kind of cool to see them on there. Um, so just that episode from last night. But then my other recommendation is there's a, talking about efficiency and you know with time. There's a company called Best Self. Have you ever heard of Best Self? Nope. They make like notebooks and stuff, um, which I guess you could say that what they sell is a premium notebook that you could do on your own, but they have um, like some organizers and they have one that is like a daily planner. And I like it because you can write everything down. You can see what the, what's going on in your day and plug in gaps, but it also has like you start the day with three things you're grateful for. You outline three goals for the day. You have a section for notes. And then at the end of the day, you have three things that were like, you could learn from three things that were um, like good accomplishments. And I like it from the scheduling out, but I also like it from the goal setting things day to day. Um, so best self company, they have a bunch of different things. They have like a, um, like a project planner as well. And this is all stuff that if you wanted to design it yourself, you could just get a, you know, a spiral notebook and do it also. But I like that it's already formatted for me. So I don't have to think about it. So those, I would recommend those. What about you? Yeah, so my media recommendation, uh, William Bernstein, who was a neurologist turned uh, investment guru and author, he was on Masters in Business with Barry Ritholtz. And if you're into investing at all, it was awesome. And this guy is kind of, um, he's kind of one of the original gurus on, you know, asset allocation and keeping investment investing simple. Uh, so I, I found it very uh, and interesting, but also, you know, I, I think I learned a decent amount too. And then my Second recommendation is a purchase I recently made, so Justin will be excited because I spent my money. Um, I had you spent a lot of money too, <laughs> <laughs> and I was looking for a, a pair of like joggers that weren't sweatpants, so just like a comfortable pair of pants to like wear while traveling. So I think I put it up on Twitter, and Daniel Crosby had responded and said, uh, "Get these Mack Weldon radius pants." So I looked them up, and the price kind of scared me. But then I think for your first purchase. Uh, or I found a code or something, you get like 15% off. So, um, but they're, they call them technical weekend travel wear. And basically they're just like, uh, joggers with more of a technical material that is water resistant and kind of wicks, uh, and dries pretty fast. Uh, so I, I, I enjoy them. I just bought a second pair actually, cause I liked them so much in a different color. And so they're pretty good for traveling and you don't really look like I, you don't look like you're wearing sweatpants, but they're comfortable. So I think it's kind of a, a, a nice way to cheat and to wear, uh, you know, stretchy pants uh, on the airplane. These are like Lululemon has a pair like that. Like all of the athleisure lines have their version of, it. I just pulled them up. They look pretty nice. I will second the brand Mack Weldon. I can't speak to the pants, but I can speak to their underwear. <laughs> I've got a few pair of underwear that I really like. Um, so Mack Weldon gets two thumbs up for us. One for me, one for me. Um, all right. So you got anything else? Is that it? I think on that note, we should wrap it up. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks everybody for listening. Sorry for the delay. Totally my fault this week. We had a crazy Sunday. So Kevin was kind enough to push back one more day. So this will be coming out on Tuesday instead of Monday. We'll be back on the regular schedule next week. So thanks for listening. Subscribe, share, all that fun stuff. Show notes at ferventfinance.com and allaboutyourbenjamins.com. And we'll see you in the next episode. Have a great week.